From Chicago, welcome to Three Degrees Discussions. I'm your host, Mike Vasquez. This is a podcast devoted to the stories behind the innovators, entrepreneurs, and leaders in the 3D printing industry. And, you know, I played evil genius. You know, my mother at the time was working for a company that basically dropped vending machines into facilities in New York. So I simply asked her, bring me home all your books, all your accounts, and I want to go through everything and find media companies. And I just started reaching out to media companies. But, you know, back in the day, I mean, it's a lot different these days, but, you know, I offered free work. I said, I'll sweep the floor anywhere I can get in. And that's how I got in, actually, for a and &E and the History Channel. I was in the shipping department, which meant that you did everything. That was Jason Lopes. Jason is currently a global market development engineer at Carbon. He specializes in custom workflows for integrating with 3D printing technologies. Having worked as a systems engineer for over 10 years, automating and processing massive amounts of 2D and 3D data for visual effects and animation, he has bridged these skills with design for additive manufacturing since 2007, with companies like Carbon, Legacy LegacyFX, and Stan Winston Studios. He's also been recognized as an AMUG Distinguished Innovator for Dino Award. Before we get started, head over to www.3degreescompany.com and subscribe to the podcast. Remember, you can listen to the show anywhere you download your podcast, including Spotify, Apple, Amazon, or Stitch. Jason, great to have you on the show today. Excited for this conversation. Um, like I do with all the guests that, that we've had on, um, let's get started from the beginning. So tell me about kind of where you grew up, where, you, where you're from, and kind of what was those, those first inches or uh, steps into manufacturing and 3D printing? All right. Yeah, thanks, Mike, for having me. Big fan. Known you for a while now. Uh, so originally from the East Coast, originally from New Jersey, uh, heavy skateboarder. Uh, all my friends were skating. Uh, very, very good. I was okay. Uh, not the best, but I had the best thing ever happened to me. My mother somehow got her hands on a camcorder way back in the day, and she gave it to me. And I just naturally started following all my friends around making movies. And that led me to go to art school for film and video in Philadelphia. Uh, so I had the opportunity to choose industrial design because that was an interest of mine. But I, sticked with, I stuck with film and video uh, because it was when computers and film, analog and digital, were kind of circling each other. And I found that fascinating. So I, I did that, and then I moved back to Manhattan, began working for a and &E in the History Channel, and then uh, after 9-11, moved out to the West Coast and started working on more bigger visual effects and things like that, and really understanding how to move data around. Uh, early on in my career, I saw a tremendous need for bridging the gap between artistic and technical. And a good example of that is when you see all these crazy uh, CGI movies that are being made, all the processing that goes into rendering all of those frames in a movie, right? If you think about it, a movie every second, you have 24 pictures, get there, add that up over time. That's intense processing. So I learned early on how to manipulate data and build out and writing Perl scripts and things like that to take advantage of distributed rendering and bringing things back together and stitching them. So moving a lot of data around. It was very fascinating. It was pretty cool being able to bridge that gap. And then after doing that, uh, I was introduced to Stan Winston, uh, special effects mastermind, and he gave me an opportunity. Uh, I helped build a facility to include digital into a physical workflow, and I've never looked back ever since. And that's when my whole step into 3D printing happened around 2006 timeframe. So maybe we can dig into kind of that whole uh, kind of transition of, uh, of your career a little bit more. Cause when I, I mean, when people think of like, Hey, I want to work in movies and things like that, even to like me as an outsider, never been in that space. Like it, it seems overwhelming to like, how do you even like meet the right people to, to get into these studios? And like, how does that make sense in terms of like, I know there's, there's film school is, is or art school and design school, as you mentioned, but like, did you have that kind of mapped out or like, what was the like series of events that kind of, as you were building kind of your toolkit that kind of led you to Stan Winston and, and some of the, the effects that, that you were doing early on? 
It's a great question. You know, everyone goes to school for it now, but it's like, how do you get in? How do you break mm -hmm. in? So for me, breaking in was back in New York on the video side of it. And, you know, I played evil genius. You know, my mother at the time was working for a company that basically dropped vending machines into facilities in New York. So I simply asked her, bring me home all your books, all your accounts, and I want to go through everything and find media companies. And I just started reaching out to media companies. But, you know, back in the day, I mean, it's a lot different these days, but, you know, I offered free work. I said, I'll sweep the floor anywhere I can get in. And that's how I got in, actually, for a and &E and the History Channel. I was in the shipping department, which meant that you did everything. Uh, moved up, took advantage of when uh, someone had to leave on vacation. They trusted me and trained me and started moving up. And then you build that experience. Once you get in on a ground floor and you start building trust of your teammates, trust is a beautiful thing because it just leads to always being invited back on the next thing, being asked to do the next thing. So fast forward over into California, a little bit different. I was established to a degree, but I wanted more. And how do I get more? And that was basically enabling artists. How can I enable an artist to do her or his craft without any technical limitation getting in the way? The minute a technical limitation comes in, it just halts everything. So I just started building trust and always wanted to go the extra mile. None of this is a nine to five mentality. It's project based, right? We don't work at a bank. It's you're there for the project and whatever is needed for that project. So it's really just, you know, I, I tell young people all the time, you know, go out there, find out what little independent films are being done that you can help with. Because once you solidify your role on that first one and you go over the top, you're going to be asked back to the next one and keep building and it'll keep, keep rolling. You know, specifically for Stan Winston, what was really neat about that is I, I identified something immediately. I was hired to be a, a digital engineer, if you will, like a system administrator. And Stan Winston did these amazing physical effects. And we had this digital department, but it was a silo. It was trying to work on, like I always give the example of the digital department at the time was working on animating Garfield the movie. And the rest of the studio was working on physically making things. So why was that different? This digital department should be another sh group in that whole process. And I went to Stan and I said, you know, the digital department's on its own. We have so many talented people in there. How do we bring this all in together and have it all mesh? And he said, well, just do it. And we started changing the way that people thought. And we had an opportunity back in the day on one of the first Halo commercials, a completely digital commercial, you know, digital content from a video game that needed to be converted over to a live action commercial. And we took advantage of it. We learned new tools. We invented our own tools and we just meshed it and made it work. And I think a, a lot of times, you know, people miss 90% of what's in front of their faces, reading in between lines on how you can improve a process, how you can bring more value into the workflow of a company is often overlooked. And I think that's where I really secured my trajectory into getting into becoming more successful within this. And how does a company like Stan Winston work? Is that like uh, someone kind of comes to them with an idea for a commercial or a film and, and you kind of, execute on that animation or live action, what it is, can you? Correct, so they'll, most of the times they'll come with a development script, something that's not fully locked yet. And you read through the script and you start identifying what can be done in a physical world. And the amazing artists at Stan Winston, which are now legacy effects, have that amazing talent, 25 years of artisanship to really break down a script, to understand what's possible in a physical world and what should be digital. You know, a great story has elements of both that come together and just pull off the story. Uh, and that's what they took pride in. And, you know, one of the first projects that came through, funny enough, it came through at this pretty much the same time as the first Iron Man movie, but it was a commercial for Halo, specifically Halo 3. And it was a no brainer for me on paper because I had been following, uh, you know, back in the day, what was the, the first person shooter game? Uh, was doing or whatever. And the whole concept of taking a digital asset into the physical world was often talked about in theory. And 
But my background of processing data and building render farms back in the day, I saw this as totally possible. And, you know, Alan Scott, which is one of the owners of Legacy Effects, he was responsible for this Halo production. You know, just having a conversation about it just opened up eyes. The assets created in the video game world, it might be low res, right, for video games, but we can take that asset, figure out a way to retopologize it, get it high resolution, pose it into what's needed for the commercial, and then output it on something called 3D printing. You know, back then, uh, we dabbled in 3D printing. The studio was actually messing around with 3D printing on Jurassic Park 3, and you even see elements of 3D printing in the Jurassic Park movie. Uh, but could we finally make this possible? And we had a very, very talented team of digital artists, but we didn't have the software that everyone used in the 3D printing space. We had you know, more entertainment software. It's funny, last night preparing for this podcast, I was thinking about this example that we're talking about, and we actually modeled our first 3D printing job with a program called you know, Soft Image XSI, which was not made for doing this type of work at all. But we had such talented people and such talented physical model makers that had converted to being digital model makers that it was a no brainer for us. And we figured it out with those limited tool sets and we didn't have a printer at the time. So we called up our buddies over at Solid Concepts, which is now Stratasys Direct and told them about this project and how crazy of a timeline it was and that we had it figured out except for the printing side. And they were like, well, send us your data. We'll take care of it. So we did that. Uh, but uh, little did we know that even though our data looked beautiful to us, our data was huge. File sizes were insane. And I'll never forget sending it up to Solid Concepts. We're all proud of our work. We finally able to do a new style of work for the company. And I get a call from Todd Mueller over at Solid Concepts basically saying, uh, you're going to need to come up here. We need to sit down. And I was like, why? Is there a problem? He's just like, no, we don't have the processing power like you guys do to handle this type of geometry that you've sent us. So, you know, I have to give hats off to, you know, Todd Mueller and Anna Villano up at Solid Concepts because I'll never forget, I took the team up to Valencia. We sat down and we started to learn where 3D printing and additive manufacturing was and how to basically take our world and get it prepared for that world uh, over an eight hour period. And once that happened, we never looked back. It was so successful for us. We went from that Halo commercial, which was absolutely insane, to the first Iron Man suit that was 100% realized with 3D printing, to now 3D printing is turnkey over at that studio. Everything goes through 3D printing to have everything created. That's a an amazing story. And as, as it evolved, like when you first sent those models over to, to solid concepts, it was kind of proof of concept. Were you even thinking about like what printer to use or what material or like, what did you have in mind? Like you were like, we're going to get some form back and we can paint it. We can do whatever we usually do to it. Or So it's funny that you say that. Cause I'll never forget, you know, we're so proud of our high resolution work and we converted all of these assets over. You got to remember, we're working on these assets for that game as they're finishing the game, right? So being able to keep these looks exactly to what was going to be released in a few weeks was, was no easy feat. But all I remember was making sure that what we sent over to Solid Concepts is what we got back in a physical resolution. And that's when we spoke with Todd and he introduced us to PolyJet technology. And we had to make something like 836 characters in an extremely quick time. And I'll never forget, you know, the parts came back and it's funny, all of our stuff was one iteration from day one. Like we didn't have to go back and forth this and that, the resolution was there, but I'll never forget we we're holding up, I was holding up one of the first prints, it was a brute file. And there was like a little piece that went along with it, like an accessory. And literally, we're just looking at this. Oh, my God, the detail is so amazing, blah, 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 and just cracked it. So right away, we just all looked at each other and we said, OK, so this is where our expertise of the shop comes in. We already see without having to be you know, trained that there are limitations in materials. We have the look, but there's limitations in materials. 
So why don't we create a hybrid workflow now in the studio and figure out how do we reinforce these things? How do we get them to go direct knowing their limitations? So we did a lot of studies and a lot of little development work and figured out how can we take prototyping materials back in 2006 and reinforce them get them to hold up, coat them, plate them, whatever is needed. And that's how we built it. We built our Bible. And it was a very simple, logical Bible. It looks good, but it can't break. And what can we do? So we did a lot of B-side reinforcement, a lot of other materials that we would bond onto that you would never see to the eye that would have things hold up. If things were under a lot of, you got to remember, commercials and movies, they're filmed under 10K lights. That's an extreme amount of heat very close onto a subject. You're talking very thin wall capes on superheroes and things like that at a small scale. That stuff's going to warp under a normal lamp. So we were really from day one learning how to work within these limitations and we never looked back and we applied that immediately to the second film, uh, second thing project of Iron Man, specifically those gauntlets, those hands that I've showed out in a lot of my keynotes right away coming off of a polyjet printer, metal etch and prime them and get them nickel plated and start assembling and we can trust it. Do you think you had a certain advantage kind of getting kind of your team uh, kind of approach to 3D printing kind of in the sense that the there are limitations, right? Like you, you work with your hands a lot and like the team is kind of design oriented. Like a lot of the challenges that I still see in the industry is like explaining some of the limitations of the technology that's not a one size fit all, but like having that mindset where it sounds like, okay, it breaks, but it gets the right form. It checks one of our boxes. What else can we do to it? Rather than like a lot of times I, I hear kind of folks in the industry is like, well, I'm just going to cast aside 3D printing. It's, it's kind of the, okay, it, it does this, but like, we're going to discard it. Like, what was, how did you kind of instill that mindset in terms of almost like, is like very much problem sol- solving um, uh, to, to what you were doing with the team? So g- g- great question. Yeah, we had an advantage. I mean, these are, you got to remember when you work in special effects and you work for Stan Winston, it's not that you're doing the impossible, you're doing the impossible first. Uh, which is a really cool way of thinking once you're in it. You have so many disciplines of different team members. Everyone brings something different to the table. On one aspect, I worked on the Aflac duck, so I got feather experts. I have welders. I have molders. I have top-class painters. You have it all. So you have this toolbox of discipline. And people come in and and you can point out a limitation and someone else can pick up from that limitation and build upon it on his or her experience of the past. So we had an extreme advantage because you're always moving forward. The word no does not exist. You break things down logically that are a big problem to smaller things and you get it done. So we've had a tremendous advantage in that mindset. So much so, which is that's the number one reason why at Legacy Effects, we never entered the AMUG technical competition because we felt that we had this advantage of of this mindset that it was just an unfair unfair playing field. So what was really exciting was normally a technology like this in a physical traditional shop has everyone putting their guards up. However, when you can show someone how a technology like 3D printing can shave off time on the front end to give them more time in their discipline, So they're not under the gun. You're basically opening up their deadline and expanding it rather than shortening it because this process enables so much upfront. They start loving it. They start building trust and want it to be a part of the workflow because now they get more breathing room and they get more excited to bring even more input and ideas and solutions into the problem. Every project we worked on was a new problem. However, when you have a technology that is helping those traditional artists, they're willing to go into their brains, into their mindset and say, okay, that's pretty cool. It can do this, but now if I did this, it'll take it to the next level. And that's what every day at this studio is like. And the other part of it too, is like, you're also pushing the 3D printing technology as well. It's like, hey, like, can we get it stronger so we don't have to do all of this stuff and what other technologies are available? And so you start even like the file, right? Like handling probably a terabyte of data, like the service bureaus aren't going <laughs> to like that very often. 
So it's funny that you say that about the data. So recently I went back, you know, I keep Bibles from all my years. It's like journaling for industry, I call it. And I suggest that to anyone that's listening, journal all of your stuff because you'll look back on it for solutions later. Back in 2010, we were creating 32 gigabytes daily of unique data. That was in 2010. I was bringing in systems that at the time, the amount of terabytes of infrastructure to facilitate what we were creating was, was unreal back then. And it was so new to remember, this is a physical analog shop. I worked with people that didn't even use a computer. And now we're introducing this tool and really trying to get like, no, no this is not a robot taking your job over. This is something that's gonna enhance the workflow and give you more time to specialize on your craft. So it, it's just, it's insane looking back to where we are today. And I'm so happy for our industry where we are today. But, you know, with the likes of all the peers that, you know, I met early on in the industry, like Ryan Larson, Johnny Cross, Bill Braun, and all the pioneers in printing industry, Everyone's been so open on and helping collaborate and figuring out solutions. We've helped figure out other companies' solutions. Other companies have helped us figure out solutions and just pushing that data and showing what's possible to open up the industry to look at this a lot differently and learn these techniques and how they can apply. You know, today it's a little different. Today, the focus seems to be and is a production mindset, which is amazing and awesome. And it's hard to replicate a lot of these skill sets in volume, if you will. Uh, but we still have a gap that we need to cross to get to these big you know, application volume numbers where this mentality can still be applied. And there's so many smart people out there, so many smart companies out there that can transform what we were doing with our hands on a, on a single unit into volume and production and with full traceability, in my opinion. I think we're just getting started here. And so you started with going to the service bureaus with kind of some initial designs. Like what was the, was there a transition then into like, Hey, we need, we're using this enough. We should bring it in house. Or like, can you describe that, that process? Those two projects were our first ones. And then in 2008, Stan Winston passed away and we started legacy effects and we knew right out the gate, we need our own machine. We need a machine in-house. What we did with the service bureau was amazing, but we got to get intimate with this technology. We got to break it. We got to put it through its ringer. We got to learn. We got to fail. You don't learn unless you fail. Uh, so convince the partners is a big story behind that, but I won't go into it here. We don't have time uh, to pick up a polyjet machine. And at first there was a little bit of hesitation. I had an amazing artist, uh, his name was Scott, Scott Patton, top artist out here in Los Angeles, done some amazing things. He had already decided that he was switching from physical sculpting to digital sculpting. And I showed him what was possible through Polyjet. And he was a champion. And if I could help bridge that gap for him, he was going to help bridge that gap for me for getting this approved and, and getting purchased. So we picked up a 260V. And one of my evil genius ways about it was, ah, I know it's expensive, this and that, but it's all about IP. We control the IP now. We don't have to worry about sending data out of house. It's going to protect our clients. So it was a no brainer. So we picked up a 260V, which is a 10 by 10 by 8 build volume, but high resolution. And then we just started exploiting it. We really started exploiting it. That machine did not run in default mode at all. Uh, I went and signed up for advanced training back in the day with Object. Remember, this is back in Object days, no reseller yet for Object, so I'm working directly with them. So I figured I would take an, an advanced course, and my company was just like, oh, that's great. You're taking this advanced course, so if the machine ever breaks, you can fix it, right? And I was like, yeah, right, but for other reasons. So hacking the machine, how can we you know, remove the carpet that it prints on? How can we print more efficiently? How can we try to reduce some purge cycles to save on economics, uh, modify voltage to do different things, and more importantly, do some development projects with other companies. Uh, you know, we started, I remember 2010, printing on fabric with Polygen. And now this is a talk buzz now going on with being able to print on textiles. 
we were modifying that back in the day and trying to put, okay, this is what we can do. We can get this type of fabric mesh, put it down, get rid of that carpet that's going to be laid down in polyjet and print direct in gloss mode on top of a mesh and now wear it on a green screen, subtract the green out. And now I can have 3D pistons and see through someone's arm on camera. We were trying to think like that right out of the gate. That's awesome. Yeah. And- and so as, as it progressed at legacy, like how long, how long were you there before you kind of transitioned to, to carbon? What was the, the next step of the story? I was at legacy for, for quite a bit. We built it in 2008 and mm-hmm. I left maybe how long ago did I leave five, six years ago. It's, it's, you know, I was there for quite a while. I mean, we went from that 260 V to a Connex 500, then brought in a Connex three, had a Fortis 250, had Envision Tech machines, had tons of FFF machines, and then Carbon Alpha machines were dropped off, and, and we never looked back. Dean uh, is over there running Legacy now, and I know they've developed from there, but it was amazing, but it turned turnkey for me, and it became very easy, and we figured it out, and I wanted something more. I wanted to go deeper into materials. I wanted to go deeper into product. You know, I'll never forget, I was at an AMUG and I did a keynote and someone came up to me and they were downplaying what they did. And uh, they're like, but what you do is amazing. I'm like, no, what you do is amazing. And they started downplaying. And he was a designer, not going to mention the company, but it was for a toothbrush. And he's like, I just designed boring toothbrushes. And I was like, yeah, but your toothbrush is like, you know, almost in every household. Like that was exciting to me. Like a person that designs a sponge, right? That sponge could be in every kitchen sink in America. Like you look at an Xbox or a PlayStation, the winning product there is it's almost in every American and every home worldwide. That's exciting to me, getting that into a design. I don't care what it is. That's rock star stuff, right? You're in almost every household. And that's when I really started turning. Like there's something here. I can transition what I've been doing for the screen, which is, been blowing people away and bringing it to a product mindset. And I decided to leave and uh, went out and, you know, eventually wound up back at Carbon working for Dana McCallum under Dana McCallum on the CPN side, uh, which was our production network, which had had me working within the industry a lot. Uh, A lot of our service bureaus, et cetera, which, which was really good because I like working for the industry. I think, you know, I work for my company and I'm loyal to my company, but I also want to be loyal to the industry because I think hand in hand, we can help grow everything to adoption and getting everything where we're trying to get it to go, where marketing is saying it's going. And and I thought that was a great fit. And it's funny because a lot of people will say, how could you leave special effects to go do this? Well, I'm I'm doing A-list stuff up at, at Carbon now. And that's what's really cool. I mean, we work on some pretty high profile you know, logos and applications. And I consider that no different than the A-list movies. Like being able to work on some of these killer products most of people haven't even heard of yet and stories will still be coming out in the future on them. But it just made sense to me. And if I can help this industry get adoption, that's what I'm going to do for this industry. So I think everyone in our industry is passionate, just like you are. Everyone that you've interfaced with, those guys that I mentioned earlier, like Larson and Cross, Everyone is so into this and it helps the industry move forward. And that's what I've loved about working in additive manufacturing. And so as you made that transition to carpet, what was the, the thought process there? I mean, it's a, it was at the time more of a startup company. I mean, there were other established 3D printing players, technology. What was the, the big appeal? So the big appeal for me was what I knew the machine was capable of. Mm-hmm. Okay. I knew from day one, at the time, it was not turnkey, okay? I like challenges. When you can get through a challenge, you can do some amazing things. So I, I knew there was something there with the technology. It was still early company. I mean, right out the gate, what I was able to do uh, with their materials just blew my mind. So if I could get under that roof, I'm going to learn a lot more. I'm going to be able to apply my way of thinking and approach to a project, to an application, a program, whatever you want to call it today, and help companies and people move it forward. So, you know, Dana took me on and I never looked back. Really started uh, finding niches, okay? 
we have an education problem. People still don't understand that, you know, designing for additive is different than designing for traditional. Uh, understanding the economics behind design is another problem uh, to get people to understand that barrier and how to deal with it and understand the value prop that additive brings up front in a program development. Understanding a new way of materials. These are two-part materials, much different than the industry has seen before. And a digital workflow. Right, A lot of the technologies that we use, they're so amazing on the outside, but when you start drilling down into the software, wow, we still have a long way to go with software. I remember you know, complaining back in the early days, I think it was still 3D SUG, it wasn't even AMUG yet, and I said, we need to focus on software. And everyone back then was still, oh, we have no problem sneaker netting it on a USB stick and plugging it into the machine, and I'm like, no, data is king. Data is going to win in all of this. This is about a software workflow that's going to really enable and open up and get people to work differently. It's one thing to change a discipline of how you design. You can't change that without developing that workflow that shows the value and reduces time and how agile it can be up front. And Carbon had that mindset. Joe DeSimone had that mindset right out of the gate on being a different type of company. It's, you know, it's not just a 3D printer, it's software, it's hardware, and it's materials. All three of them together, and we put it, and they put a big focus on software right out of the gate, and that's what really impressed me. And as well, I mean, as your, your role, you had this kind of building the network of carbon around the, the ecosystem, but I, I'm guessing it was similar in the fact that as you were at Legacy, like you have all these different types of projects coming at you. I mean, that's all in the high level of, of, of movies and effects, but like you're being asked to do different things and solve different problems. Whereas you bring a new printer, a new software platform out into automotive, into sporting goods, into all these different industries that they're trying to solve different problems. I'm, I'm sure that's exciting as well in terms of seeing something that's just in a different yeah. lens that you'd been doing before. Beyond. Yeah. It's really, Carbon is a very, very creative company. And, and that really attracted me early on, especially with that Adidas partnership, the, sh the shoe. You say what you want about the production of, 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 those, of those shoes, but it showed me the creative flair that Carbon was thinking in and building these supporting application development groups inside of Carbon and that there was a creative lane within this. Uh, yeah, we, we do widget printing. Everybody does widget printing. But if you look at the products that are coming out of carbon, it really is just a parallel link to what I was doing in the movies. It's pretty phenomenal. It's pretty creative. It's not your traditional design work. It's really high level, very smart people, new way of designing, nice looks to it. And it really, it attracted me. And I, and I like it. And I, and I thank God that it attracted me because I look at where we're at today and some announcements we're going to be having in the not so distant future. It's pretty exciting. And I've been just as creative at Carbon in my tenure at Carbon as I've been in my industry in special effects and visual effects. I mean, it's satisfying me and I'm getting more and more out of it. You know, one of my recent uh, programs that I worked on to help save. I won't go too into detail with it, but uh, was a conversion from a traditional injection molding tool that went wrong overseas, high level client. It was for the Caliva brand. Uh, it's called Monogram. It's Jay-Z's company and converting a traditional design product over to a toolless workflow for volume production. I did some, you know, quick, quick iterations with one of my team members, Tyler, over a three-day period, we convinced him that it would work. The quality was there, just like in my movie checklist, if you will. Quality was there. Weight, feel, psychology was there. We were able to replicate the technical drawings, the mold tech callouts, show it was possible, and then hand shook it to our network and hand it over to the team at Dinsmore to execute final tweaks and production. That went from proof of concept bridge to over 27,000 unit production run that's still ongoing. So it's, it's really exciting stuff. And how is the kind of your thinking evolved in terms of building your own team? I mean, you, you've got people that you work with at, at Carbon and, and exploring 3D printing in so many different disciplines. Like, 
have you taken some of those lessons of you just kind of just like uh, volunteering essentially for, for jobs and kind of looking at like how you kind of bring people into the space or when you're, even when you're like, I, I'm, I'm just interested in this kind of, what are the personalities that personality types that succeed in this industry? And, and I've kind of got a mentality that like, once you meet someone, you kind of know, like, yeah, they're, they're going to do, do well in this space. Like, have you kind of built a, a mindset with, with what you're doing and all that you've seen? That, 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 that's exactly how I operate. You know, up at Carbon, I'm not on the manager side. I was a manager when I was running the studio up there for a little bit. And that's what I look for when I interview people. But this goes back to one of my best hires ever back when I was at Legacy Effects. You know, you get all these resumes in and you, you see what it is on paper. And then, and then you have an interview and a lot of times there's just a miss and you don't have that click where you have that confidence in knowing that that hire is going to be the right person for the job. And, you know, a lot of my stuff is conversational and I can get a pretty good idea of where someone's at. And for me, it's all, I'm very blue collar raised. So, you know, 150% is my default. I understand the value of a dollar. So I'm working hard for my dollar and I want my company to see the value in me right? And keep me going. You know, my, one of my best hires ever, and I'll never forget, you know, people scratching their heads and she wound up being absolutely amazing. She was my Starbucks barista for two years. Through every morning conversation, I knew what this person was capable of and knew what she wanted to do. She was an artist. She was going through art school. We were having conversations. I kept seeing where she was at. And then finally, one day when I just knew it was time, said, how do you feel about leaving Starbucks and coming to work over at Legacy Effects? And she did and never looked back. And I look for that today with my team members too. I, I don't care what the resume says. I mean, it's nice what the resume says and you've invested all of that time into school and all of that. However, a lot of times it's just your personality and what you're aspiring to do and what you're capable of. And you don't need to know everything, but if you want to know everything, that's another great trait. And engaging into the project and just, you know, I give blood, sweat, and tears to all my projects. And when you get similar passion and similar like-minded people, it's like no brainer. And you know who's possible to do what and you attract special people. And then you sit back and you look at this amazing team. Up at Carbon, there's so many amazing employees. It, it's ridiculous. On paper, it's scary, actually. The education behind them. But what they're able to do creatively and getting them to think a little different and look outside the box, look around the box a little bit. And how, how can we get through that? What people say is impossible by just having a conversation and leaning on past projects where we might have failed, but we learned through those failures and just engaging. That really leads to some really cool things. So I try to tell everyone, uh, you know, I think you even had Maddie, my old intern for two years doing some stuff with you for a while. She's another great example. You know, you, you talk to her for two minutes and you know that she's capable of anything, right? And you just want to fuel a person like that with stuff that's going to excite them and where you know they'll be able to be challenged and be able to obliviate that challenge with their passion and pushing through it. So good dynamic conversation with people, and just being open for the task and going above and beyond is normally how you build great teams. Yeah. And I think that's great advice for anyone that's listening and kind of looking to get into the space too, is when you get those conversations kind of, kind of share a little bit, be humble and one kind of that idea of wanting to learn more about the, the technology or whatever it may be. Exactly. And I think the, reflecting a little bit on, on this conversation, like how have you seen the adoption of 3D printing within organizations change over the time you've been involved or, or has it changed in, in, in many ways? So, you, you know, adoption is an, an interesting thing. Uh, it's easy to adopt it, right? When you're, when you're a hobbyist, very simple thing to do. I'm going to bring in a 3D printer, add it into my home bench, and there you go. Companies, right, they've invested in, in their style, how they bring a product to market. A little bit harder thing to break in and change, right? But through education, it gets people to open up their eyes differently. 
uh, and you start getting adoption and, you know, adoption and changing paths costs a lot of money for companies at times. It's an investment. And then you have to worry about workforce. Is there a workforce to step in and carry this torch, if you will, of quality that we're used to and we're known for? So there's high risk there as well. And it makes people think, well, maybe next year, maybe next year. But then, you know, they want to make sure that they innovate and stay ahead of their competition. But time and need changes things, right? We all are going through this pandemic. And that's the biggest opener that I've seen is when this pandemic hit, rather than sensationalizing 3D printing, really showing how 3D printing can assist and complement in a time of need really gets people to say, okay, there's something here worth looking at. Let's learn, let's be educated, let's fill it, figure out what our need is, get that satisfied, and then start influencing out to other groups in the organization. And that's exactly what I've seen, you know, throughout, throughout COVID is more people seeing how it's helping a time in need, whether it be a bridge gap or just one big order of some PPE. And then it's like, okay, get all hands on deck. Let's go back to these companies now and get educated by them. So that's another cool thing that's about our space, Mike, in my opinion. We have a lot of service bureaus. We have a lot of people out there that, you know, make parts for money. But we all know, especially in our industry, that it's more than making that part. How much people give out for educating their clients to get them to the next level is second to none. We probably in our industry give out more educational free time than actually printing time. And I call it, you know, these days, it's not a necessarily a client vendor relationship. There's more partnership going on and growing together to understand how to utilize these tools in the best possible way to make the best possible product together. And I see that a lot these days. For sure. And so can as we wrap up this conversation, probably first of many on the podcast, I hope. Um, what what are you looking forward to in the, the next few months? What's on your radar? Next few months? Well, I'll be over at Form Next, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, it's nice seeing everybody again. Uh, however, it's also nice leveling up with everyone. You know, there, there's a lot of competition out there. And coming from movies and special effects, I welcome competition and I love it. I think competition allows every one of us to push each other further. And the industry has, you know, really advanced. It really has. I mean, you look at the metal side, just on LinkedIn. I mean, how much metal is out there these days? It's absolutely phenomenal. And there's a lot of options out there. But more importantly, there's a lot more advanced applications going on. You're seeing almost commonplace to very high advanced levels of work on a daily basis, whether it be in prosthetics, whether it be in just normal widgets, finishing, downstream processes, right? There's a whole podcast right there. What happens after the print? That's been a lot of my talk track this past year is there's so many things going downstream that are opening up this world and it's almost becoming default, default talk. And that, that's very exciting to me. It's going to advance so much together that, I mean, who knows what's coming next? There's a lot of stuff coming, but it, I mean, these users are really taking it to the next level. And I think we're going to see some really neat stuff. Awesome. Well, appreciate the time today and look forward Thanks to for seeing us. you uh, AMUG or wherever it may be next. Absolutely. Thank you again for having me.